Chris, and my wife Chris is with me. Where did you there? She's with me, Chris. And uh, Chris is uh, my partner, of course, and not only in life but in the campaign. And she's a very good driver, and uh, that allows me to spend all my time with the cell phone past my head. Um, we do have five children, and they range in ages from 31 to 5. So, you know, we. We just thought this empty nest thing seemed boring, <laughs> and so we went, we went and got ourselves a little one. We, we adopted, adopted a little boy, and uh, she's a joy of our life, along with, with uh, our now, what, 10 week old grandbaby, Lila. And so, my perspective, really, in how I uh, approach not just the campaign, but governing, is centered to a large degree on, on the many generations in our lives. Chris and I have parents in the 70s and 80s that's living in our state. And yes, I was raised in Kinder. My folks still live in Kinder. Um, retired from their original work, but uh, continue to, to work. My dad mows the lawn, basically, at the school and the football field and the baseball diamond and all those things. And they care for a, uh, and a couple of apartment buildings and keeps them busy and young and a little spending money and all. Um, it's funny to hear Kevin talk about my uh, past service. I appreciate that. Uh, Chris and I recently were in Washington, and I was speaking to leadership, uh, Republican leadership. I am what they call a young guy. I know, don't laugh. It's, it has nothing to do with age. It's a criteria based on um, preparedness for service and uh, campaign organization and competitiveness of, uh, of your candidacy. And as you know, this is an open seat. This is an open seat, so it's, it's got a high target on it for both sides. And uh, so I was called out to, to go out to speak to leadership. And we were at a breakfast meeting uh, in a room, you know, similar to this, maybe a little bit bigger, but the, the tables were set in a great big square. And there were about 50 members uh, sitting around the table, and uh, I think it was Congressman Cantor or, or Kevin McCarthy, I don't remember which, but that, that read my, as I like to say, read my obituary. I read my biography and mentioned that I was a tourism director in Ed Schaefer's first term and then the director of economic development and finance in the second term and now heading on the public service commission. And uh, before I could even speak, before the you know, applause had even ended, <laughs> right across from me was, was the Speaker of the House and, and um, Chairman Ryan. And Paul Ryan raised his hand and said, wait, wait, I have a question. What exactly was your pitch when you were tourism director? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, Mr. Mr. Budget Chairman, I said, when I was a tourism director, North Dakota had the distinction of being the least visited state in the country. But as an energy regulator, when I walk in the room, it's as though Walt Disney himself entered. Because everybody <laughs> knows about North Dakota. All of a sudden. sudden, we carry a brand with us that everybody pays attention to. They're curious about it. They're impressed with it. They, uh, they just want to know how it's done. How do you have an economy like North Dakota? And so it's been a blessing these last nine years to be an energy regulator overseeing this most dynamic economy in the country, really. It is sort of the envy of the country. The, uh, Chairman Ryan came around the table right away when I was done to apologize, make sure that I knew he was just kidding, <laughs> as I know. And uh, let me know that he. His favorite week every year is the week he spends at Devil's Lake hunting ducks and geese. And at that time, I thought maybe this year he'd do it again, but probably not. <laughs> probably not. Um, at least we'll hear about it this time. It won't be a well-kept secret. Uh, with that, um, get back to this point of, uh, of these, this grandbaby and these parents of ours. And, and this challenge we have in our, in our country. A challenge is, quite honestly, is uh, it's not insurmountable, but it's becoming more difficult all the time. One of the things I said to, uh, in, in following up with, with Paul Ryan on, on this issue of being from North Dakota, I said, we, don't, we no longer come with a, a handout, if we ever did. We come now with a major contribution, a contribution to not only to the budget, not just an economic contribution, but a solutions contribution. Because with this brand and this credibility that comes with being from North Dakota comes a responsibility to share what we know and to share our experiences. And they actually, you know, have a have a pulpit, if you will, even as a freshman member, you know, to, to, to be able to say, hey, we've got some solutions. 
And uh, I, it, with regard to healthcare, which is, of course you're the most interested in, uh, that's part of the big picture. One of the things that used to get me in trouble when there were six of us Republicans running for this job, um, there were six of us at one time running for the nomination, the endorsement, and we'd have all of these debates. And, uh, and I would always say, w w when my friends would say, we need to pull Obamacare out by the roots, and they'd gladly stand there and pound their chest and say, you know, hell no, we won't go, and, you know, and they were against everything. And I understand that. I want to repeal Obamacare as badly as anybody. But I'd always say, look, any regulation, law, policy, uh, tradition, for that matter, usually has as its root the abuse of somebody's freedom. Somebody took their freedom and abused them. And consequently, the government usually overcorrects the <laughs> abuse. And, and, and we open the door to this one-size-fits-all, this, this overreaching my view, this single-payer system goal, by, uh, by not dealing with healthcare inflation when, when we had the opportunities to as a majority party. And, um, and that always drew some criticism from my conservative friends. Because somehow it seemed disloyal. And, and, and yet I'd say, look, we have had this opportunity for longer. There has been, we know, an acknowledged problem with healthcare inflation. And, uh, and while we talked about solutions, and perhaps we tried, and, 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 and we hadn't been able to pull it off, the door was open for what became known as Obamacare. And, um, and now we find ourselves with, in a fragile economy anyway, with all kinds of new taxes that have already been imposed, and several larger ones to be imposed later, um, lack, lack of, uh, freedom for consumers and patients and doctors. And so I do want to repeal it, but it's not enough just to repeal it. We have to be able to replace it with something that works. No surprise probably to any of you, uh, those of you that followed the race or followed me for that matter for a long time, that, that I'm a free marketer. I believe that markets actually work. I think frankly that the Medicare prescription drug program that, that so many of my conservatives hated, conservative friends hated, um, that George Bush signed into law, has proven that a market can work, that some sort of a premium support system that keeps a market, a competitive market alive, can work, because we've seen prescription drugs actually come down in cost as a result of the premium support as opposed to some other direct uh, uh, payment uh, that, that actually price follows up. One of the things I've observed in government for a long time is that whenever there's a monopoly, and especially when it's government monopoly, inflation happens at a much faster rate than it does in the real market. Why does higher education have to outpace uh, inflation? Why does defense spending, defense contract? Why does health care? Why does, frankly, any level of education? Because price follows money. And in our attempts to do good, and there's no end to the good government can do if it has unlimited funds, and will do. Price follows it. Every time you, every time you uh, give another thousand dollars to a college student, the price of tuition goes up a thousand dollars, coincidentally. So we have to get our hands, I think, wrapped around the cost side. Uh, I'm not going to surprise any of you with any new innovative ideas, um, but I do believe that. People spending their own money make better decisions than people relying on somebody else making payments. I, I first thing I want to see in, <coughs> is I, I want to see this cap awards for uh, frivolous lawsuits. It, as you know, your doctors certainly know that the uh, the cost of malpractice insurance is eating them alive, and then the risks that they have to mitigate um, add to the cost of, of healthcare. We've done that in North Dakota to a great degree. We can do it on the national level if necessary, although I prefer states uh, having more to do with everything, including healthcare, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, and then I, I want to see, I want to see competition. Competition works. It works in every system I've ever seen. I'm a, I'm a monopoly regulator. Even in regulating monopoly businesses like electric utilities and natural gas utilities, 
And by the way, North Dakota enjoys the lowest residential retail rates of both of those energy sources in the country. Um, when you apply competition market principles, even to that, you find low rates. We're in a case right now with XL Energy called performance-based rate making. We said to them in the last rate case, we want you to bring ideas for performance-based rate making. What is that? That's applying market forces, competitive forces, to a monopoly. We will increase your, um, your share or your return on equity and your return on investment allowed if you have better customer service. You have fewer outages for shorter periods of time. We'll allow you to keep more of your profits. If you screw up and have too many problems, we'll force you to pay consumers. As though you have competition. And we create market incentives for them to do the right thing. We can do that. We can do that with a monopoly. Certainly we can create competition where competition exists, unleash competition where it can exist. By allowing patients to keep more of their own money, make more of their own decisions, to shop around, bring costs down. And, and I can get to a little more specific on that, but this isn't new stuff to you. It's just, I'm telling you my philosophy, because I believe in one. Um, I also think, and I, I refer to it as a perverse We have got to make it more beneficial for people to stay healthy than to get sick. The idea that you don't even get to cash in on your insurance unless you go to the doctor is a perverse incentive in my view. Once again, by letting people keep more of their own money, whether it's a health care savings account, <coughs> for example, or some mechanism like that, we take away the incentive to run to the doctor for every step <laughs> and rather create an incentive to stay healthy. I appreciate the fact that Blue Cross Blue Shield allows Chris and I to use some, uh, to help us belong to the Y, for example, to stay healthy. And the incentive is stay healthy as opposed to this perverse incentive to get sick. Very simplistic, I understand, but I also believe it. I believe that, that we can have catastrophic insurance alternatives for people that protect them from major losses while at the same time providing them the incentives to stay healthy and avoid those if, if possible. Um, with that, you guys really have to go on and on, but I want to talk about what's on your heart and mind, and we can dig in a little bit into the weeds if you want to the best of my ability. I'm an energy expert. I know a lot about economics and the economy, jobs creation, wealth creation, what kind of things we can bring in terms of budget. One thing I can tell you for sure, it's not unrelated, this health care issue and federal budget. We have a $16 trillion debt, in case you hadn't heard about it. $16 trillion, a debt that exceeds the productivity of our nation. Can you imagine? A debt that exceeds gross domestic product. It's a big deal. We cannot ignore it. We cannot pretend it doesn't exist. We cannot even, we cannot even afford to put it very low on priorities. I put everything in the context of that $16 trillion debt in terms of my, my philosophy right now as it relates to spending, and the government because it's just inappropriate that we borrow money from China on the backs of our grandchilds and, and her friends and peers. So with that, let's uh, let me just open it up. Is that okay if I do that? If I just open it up and yes. hold yes. a town hall forum? Is that okay? That's fine. Uh, you guys, just so you know, I love town hall forums. One of the things that I've learned in as a public service commissioner is that when you take issues and you bring yourself as close to the issue as possible. Not only do you give the people an opportunity to share, and in some cases to vent. By the way, do you know what, when we hold these hearings around the state, we, I've held probably well over 100 of them, on things like pipelines, transmission lines, um, power plants, refineries, gas processing facilities, lots of wind farms. We always go to the community where the investments take place. And do you know that almost nobody that shows up is for the investment. In, in other words, the point is to bring people who have concerns. We call them Protestants. Actually, we call them Protestants, but everyone's so on. But, and, and, I, I'm, I'm, but um, I like it. And, and it's not just because you get the opportunity to vent or to share your ideas. But then the public official gets the benefit of all of that wisdom. And so one thing you'll find out about me, uh, whether it's as your public service commissioner or a candidate, or your congressman is that I'll always be available. Not, not, not because I'm such a swell guy, but because I need you. 
because I need you, because nobody can know everything. So with that, um, comments, questions, thoughts, about anything that you might be interested in. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, uh, <coughs> Kevin, thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. You made in, uh, a comment um, in, in your, well, you made a statement in your opening comments about the um, supporting the repeal of ACA yes. as we go through. Yeah. There's an important provision in there as it relates to North Dakota yes. health care, the, the Frontier Amendment, yes. funds about $68 million a year to get us to the national average, right. uh, not, not above, but the average for, for, uh, uh, for reimbursement. But that goes away if the ACA goes away. Sure. So how do you, how do you ensure um, that equity-based um, uh, legislation uh, retains uh, or re is retained? Well, just like you got it there in the first place. I mean, not everything about it is obviously bad. The problem is if we don't repeal it, we are going to be stuck with a lot of it that is bad. Not the least of which are the taxes, and there are a lot of them that are just killing business and killing jobs. And frankly, it's a, it's a, it's a Sort of hollow victory, you know. You get you get paid an equitable rate for the procedures and, and the services you provide. If our economy collapses, so that's item number one. But to me, frankly, one of the things that's always offended me is that we call it an amendment at all. I understand it's yeah. an amendment to a bill because that's the way Congress talks. But the reality is, fundamental fairness should be an, an amendment. It should be a culture. It should be a tradition. It has to be secured. It's, it's item number one as far as I'm concerned is to make sure that that is part of any new um, bill or legislation. That, that a process or a procedure or a service is worth what it's worth. It's, it's worth based on <laughs> the value of it in any marketplace. And it ought to be the national average for sure. We realize there's a different market forces. But, but why should our doctors or why should our clinics or our hospitals who are providing, quite frankly, superior service <laughs> to many other areas that are getting paid more, why shouldn't they get it? Let's do that. So I'm with you 100%. Fight for it to, to, with every ounce of political capital I can muster. Um, but that's, you're right, that's an important, a very important point. Kevin, I just Bless want to follow up with what Kevin just said. Uh, when I sit at our national meetings and listen, it's my understanding that about 40% of the hospitals across the country are getting some type of a special deal uh, with their reimbursement. And I believe, uh, and I can't remember if it was Senator Hoover and Senator Conrad, somebody once said that there are 62 amendments yeah. out there to help all of this. How do you, how do you envision in leveling that, uh, you know, we have a graph in our office that uh, uh, North Dakota is in the top eight of quality. Sure. But we rank 46, 47, 48 in reimbursement. The state of Louisiana ranks first in Medicare reimbursement and 50th in quality. You know, how do you envision that we can bring that together so that there's some equity in the system? Well, of course, remember, I'm not elected yet, so I have the advantage of being idealistic. You know? Uh, <laughs> so, but I also acknowledge that. Uh, that idealism is easy when, before you're there. I'm a, how should I put it? I like things flat. I like everything flatter. I think fairness is fundamental in my, in my mind. So how do I envision doing it? I mean, I'm one out of 435. I envision rolling up the sleeves, building the coalitions that need to be built to do it. But you guys, I, I think that, I do think that in the context of the $16 trillion debt, which is widely acknowledged by everybody as a major problem, that we have opportunities to do exactly what you're talking about that we never had before. Because it, here, here's the risk we run, by the way. You, you probably have thought of this. <laughs> Part of fairness might be to flatten everybody down to a lower amount. That's not our goal. Our goal, of course, ought to be, whether Kevin is this, this average or whatever the, the reimbursement ought to be, to find out what that is, to flatten it, to remove all of these 62 amendments or exemptions or, or loopholes or whatever it might be. Now, I could be talking about the tax code. I could be talking about the EPA, I, or I could be talking about, uh, you know, uh, Dodd Frank, or I could be talking about healthcare. All of this needs to be simplified. And quite frankly, I think that our country is crying out for that, I, I, because, as you know, compliance is one of the biggest challenges to complexity. And you, you all, just like the banks and just like uh, energy companies and farmers and everybody else, has to spend an inordinate amount of money and resources on compliance. 
And compliance has a lot of costs, not just the CPA, the extra CPA you have to hire, or the extra lawyer you have to hire, or, or auditors or whatever, but also then the recurring um, mitigation that goes with all of that. So I like things simple. Maybe it's because I have, I'm kind of simple myself, but I prefer things simple. And, that, and, and I think if you looked at my work on the public service commission, you'd find out that I've, uh, I've done a lot of that. I, one thing about um, being on the public service commission is we deal a lot with um, engineers, economists, and lawyers. And they're all really smart. And one of the things I've learned to do is ask for their advice, then dismiss them, then make the decision. When, once I, after I've applied then the weight of the voter, the weight of the, the taxpayer and the consumer. So kind of a philosophical answer because I'm not there yet, but Understood. flatten it out. It's, it shouldn't have to be that complicated. And I think people are asking for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to echo the thank yous for being here. We appreciate you making the time. Um, Keith Boyson from Delhi City. Um, and my question for you goes back to your comments on open market and uh, competition and that kind of thing. Uh, the difficulties with rural health care in particular uh, is that when we talk about competition, our competition is the federal government. Yeah. Typically more than 50% of our revenues come from the federal government. Um, so it's not truly a local market competition kind of thing. Uh, and the other payers typically follow the federal government's reimbursement yes. models and, and we get paid the same way. If you were elected to office, what what do you see happening? And we all realize, everybody in this room, and I said this before, you haven't had the, the benefit of listening to what we've been listening to yes. the last two and a half days, but um, if you are elected, how do you see the whole Medicare program changing so that the one group that we are competing with for those dollars, which is the federal government, um, is more reflective of what's happening in our markets so that roughly three-fifths of the hospitals in this state are not operating in a deficit market. Yeah. That's a lot. Um, that's a lot. I want you to give me an example. This will help me. Give me an example of the, the competition with the federal government. Just give me one. It's probably a bad term. Okay. In, in fairness. Yeah. But when we look at competing for a customer, Yes. Those customers are typically driven to us by the payer. Okay, that's they're right. not. They're, it's not an open market where they can, uh, where a Medicare patient can say, "Well, um, I get a better deal over here." The Medicare payment is the same regardless of what hospital they go to. Right. So it's not truly that open market competition that you're talking about. It's not a. It's not a, uh, a fair business model that we're operating in, and we have to go to you guys, kind of hat in hand, uh, to say. How are we going to manage our payments? Because we're not we're losing money every time we treat 50% of our population. Yeah, and you should never have to lose money. I mean, you should just simply never have to lose money because of because of a shortage of government payment for something that's worth something more. I, I mean, and that's easy for me to say. I understand that, and and but that's one of the injustices of, of our system, in my view. Now, how do we how do we get you reimbursed properly? First thing we have to acknowledge is what you just said. Rural is different than urban. Having one provider as opposed to two or more is different in terms of what you offer. And Valley City is certainly different than Allendale, mm -hmm. right? And, and Allendale is different than Henry. Um, but there are obviously some similarities. So I don't know that I have a bullet for you, but I would certainly want to talk about it. I want to hear more about it and hear how we might be able to move that ball forward. But when I talk about, I'm talking about cost, <coughs> of course. I'm talking about cost competition. Not, not so much the, the money competition. If we can get costs down, including yours, you know, mm -hmm. then, then of course, we have different, different issues. So when I talk about competition, I'm talking about competition with cost. Um, May I ask a follow-up clarification yeah, question? Yeah. To maybe yeah. get more to it. Yeah. As I kind of said in my first question, I don't think there's a person in the room who doesn't recognize that something needs to happen with Medicare soon, or we're in big yeah, trouble. 12 years, it's in 12. Yeah. What, what is your, your personal approach to how that okay. should be managed and how should we pay that? Good question. With regard to Medicare itself, first of all, the acknowledgement, which by the way, I think we have an entire political party that ignores it, that doesn't, that acts as though it's not going to be insolvent in 12 years. We've been asked insolvency of it just in, in recent years. And it's, that solvency gets enhanced by inflation, inflation of, of the cost uh, of, of health. So acknowledging this is the first thing. I do favor 
the approach of drawing a line and, and avoiding, to some degree, buys time, but also avoiding the uh, generational warfare, as I like to call it, that has been a sport in healthcare politics for the last 20 or 30 years. And drawing that line at an age. You know, Paul Ryan says 55. I, 55 is good with me, but maybe 50 is better. Maybe 52. I think this is an area where if we can agree that we should draw a line and have and, and provide choices at, at a lower level, at a younger age, and, and provide complete certainty to seniors and those approaching seniors at another level, you avoid some of the political problems that we have if we don't do that. So I do like that. I also like, you guys, I like premium support programs that provide choice with certainty. And, and so if you have, and I don't have all the answers, but for example, if you create a, a situation where the premium support supports the second lowest alternative, the second lowest price to cost alternative, you provide an opportunity for people to find one lower and, and, make, and keep the difference. It's an incentive to do that. Or to find a more expensive one and pay the difference. It creates a little bit of competition, it creates a little bit of choice, um, but Let's let Medicare be one of them. You know, Medicare is, I don't know if Winston Solvent, I think right away this something like 24% has to be found if we don't do anything. Well, that 24% is either going to be found in the losses to you, right? Or some increase, I suppose, in taxes, which still doesn't seem to be a great appetite for. Uh, so something like that, I believe, and I also think Medicare, like healthcare in general, it has to have some incentives for staying well, for nutrition, healthy living, whatever the case may be, but some incentive to stay to stay well and stay healthy. Realizing, of course, we're dealing with people uh, in the last half of their life or, or last quarter of their life, as opposed to the first quarter, they're going to have more choices. I, I acknowledge. I think some people tend to oversimplify that. Um, so, in a nutshell, that's my basic philosophy on Medicare. But I do think by drawing <coughs> the line and, and avoiding the generational warfare, we're going to have more honest discussion. I say down here with the younger with younger folks and have more rigorous deb debate and discussion. Buy some time, if you will. Um, even if we buy ten more years, then we can have a serious discussion. The problem with Congress is, is that they don't see ten years ahead. They see two years ahead, evidently, um, and that's the cultural thing. <laughs> we'll have to try and change. Thank you. That's the for in that one. Yes, sir. Yeah, um I'm hoping to give you a little bit of a bullet. Um, those who know me, I meander a bit, so I'll have a point, I promise. It's going to take me a little while to get there. First, with the conversation surrounding Medicare, I want to take one step back and talk about Medicaid. And as a health care provider myself for 15 years prior to stepping into this role, I can tell you one of the issues Medicaid has <coughs> is its reimbursement and the general attrition with practitioners willing to see those patients. Now, if you step out of your larger centers in the state like North Dakota to your rural communities, who I've had the pleasure of working with, I will tell you, reimbursement is, no shock, part and parcel with how they provide care. <coughs> if you are looking to create a Walmart system where larger and larger centers have to treat more and more Medicare patients to meet their bottom line, then we need to stay on the path we are on where things like the Frontier Amendment will potentially go away. Reimbursement will be a linear level across state lines and county lines and country lines. The reality of the rurals and where this is the bullet, so here comes the point. The reality of the rurals and what I would like you to consider is benefiting those rural facilities, whether it's in North Dakota or Montana or statewide, as you talk to your constituents, if you get elected, we need to reward these rural facilities for keeping patients local, minimizing the travel necessary. Mm -hmm. Obviously, specialties are different issues, but there are a lot of patients who have the potential to stay in a rural facility. And if you can tie reimbursement bonuses to days of stay in a rural facility to eliminate or minimize the need to transfer up, to always send out, to tell those rural facilities that it is in your best interest, not just because the people living in your community don't want to travel 80 miles, 100 miles to come to a Bismarck or to a Fargo, or if you're in Montana, going to Billings or wherever the larger centers are, but that not only are we going to empower you to stay, but we're going to have some real dollars attached to that. That is an actual bullet that will benefit 
your rural partners in healthcare in North Dakota and other states. So if I would encourage you to consider not wholesale cuts, although again, we do realize that is a necessity. We cannot occupy the same bubble we're in and expect them not to pop and drop us all thousands of miles down to the ground and whoever survives, survives. But the bullet I think you need to have with a lot of the people in this room is how do you reward centers for care, especially those that are off the grid from a Medicare standpoint and allow them to treat and keep people more within their regions that will save you costs because you will not have ambulance costs, you will not have transfer costs, you will not have 